Welcome to this Smith & Nephew Digital Education Module on the Physiological Basics of Wound Healing, which forms part of a series of modules you can access to develop your knowledge and understanding around wound care. Today, we will be discussing the physiological basics of wound healing. By the end of the module, you will understand the four phases of wound healing and how they interact in order for wound healing to take place. We will also consider the types of wound healing you will see in clinical practice. A wound occurs when the integrity of any tissue is compromised. Examples of these are skin breaks, muscle tears or burns. It may be caused as a result of a fall, a surgical procedure, an infectious disease or an underlying pathological condition. It is generally associated with a loss of tissue and an impairment of function. The types and causes of wounds are wide ranging and there are several different ways of classifying them. Wounds can be either chronic and an example of this could be a leg ulcer. They can be acute, which could be due to trauma. Wounds can be open in which the skin has been compromised and underlying tissues are exposed. And of course, wounds can be closed, in which the skin has not been compromised, but trauma to underlying structures has occurred. And an example of this is a bruised rib. The wound healing process is a complex series of events that starts, as you can see, with an injury, which can continue for weeks, months or even years. The phases of wound healing are hemostasis, acute inflammation, cell proliferation and repair, and epithelialization and remodeling of scar tissue. For a wound to heal successfully, all four phases must occur in the proper sequence and time frame. Many factors can interfere with one or more phases of this process meaning that the wound could fail to heal. The first phase of wound healing is hemostasis, which begins immediately after the wound occurs. Bleeding has the immediate effect of cleansing the wound as the blood washes away foreign bodies and organisms. To prevent further bleeding, vascular constriction and fibrin clot formation occurs. This vasoconstriction lasts for only a few minutes, however, just long enough for the leaks to be sealed by blood clots. The surrounding wound tissue releases pro-inflammatory cytokines and growth factors, which help with the first stages of healing. The second phase of wound healing is acute inflammation, which is part of the body's own natural defense system. It starts at the time of injury and normally resolves within two to three days. Inflammation is crucial in supplying growth factors and cytokine signals that coordinate the movement of cells. Once the bleeding has stopped, the blood vessels within the wound dilate. This allows fluid to carry the cells that are needed for the wound healing process. The main cells involved in the process perform phagocytosis, which means that these cells can ingest and destroy harmful particles, bacteria and dead cells. In the diagram, you can see that in the presence of infection, the wound gets stuck in a cycle of chronic inflammation and tissue damage, which prevents the wound from healing. A variety of factors influence this cycle of inflammation, for example, the presence of bacteria, patient comorbidities, and factors from the environment. The proliferative phase is about rebuilding new granulation tissue. New tissue is regenerated and constructed by fibroblasts, the cells responsible for the development of new blood vessels, collagen, and other connective tissue. It is at this stage of the process the new collagen fibres start to reorganise and the strength of the wound increases. The tissue is now referred to as granulation tissue 
and should be red to pink in appearance. It is important to remember that collagen synthesis is dependent on the presence of vitamin C, iron and copper. If there is a deficiency of these substances, satisfactory wound healing is not possible. As part of the proliferative phase, new blood vessels are stimulated by macrophage activity and begin to grow into the matrix. This is known as angiogenesis. This means that extra oxygen and nutrients are delivered to the healing tissue and metabolic waste can be removed. Specialised fibroblasts also pull together the wound edges and the surface area of the wound is reduced and will continue until wound closure. Epithelialization is the last phase of healing, which leads to wound closure. Epithelial cells, which are located in hair follicles, sweat glands and around the edges of the wound, divide and migrate over the newly formed granulation tissue. The wound surface will eventually be covered with epithelial cells. Cell migration then stops and the epithelial cells will begin to form the many layers of the epidermis. It is important to remember that an optimal wound healing environment is needed for this process. Epithelialization will not take place where there is necrotic tissue or slough present, so accurate wound bed preparation would need to take place. Maturation occurs once the wound is fully closed. The newly formed collagen matures, increasing the strength of the wound and reorganises to form a scar. However, the skin tissue will only regain 80% of its original strength. The scar tissue does not have an effective blood supply, so it is avascular in nature. This is why the scar appears paler than the surrounding tissue. The scar will normally flatten over time and will not contain any sebaceous or sweat glands. So how long does this process take? Well, it can take many months for maturation to be complete and for very large wounds, it can take years. In clinical practice, you will come across a variety of wounds that will heal in different ways. Primary intention healing occurs in wounds that are brought together by sutures, staples or clips. So think of patients that have had surgery or other procedures. Provided there are no complications such as infection or dehiscence, these wounds tend to heal quickly and with minimal scarring. Secondary intention healing occurs in wounds where there is a considerable tissue loss. So think of patients with pressure ulcers and venous leg ulcers. The wound edges are not brought together and the wound fills with granulation tissue over time. Tertiary intention healing occurs when the wound edges are left open for a few days in order to allow for further surgical investigations or reduction in swelling and edema. An example of this would be a patient with an open abdomen following lengthy surgery of the colon. The edges are brought together once the surgeon is satisfied that the patient is stable. Healing would then take place by primary intention. To check your knowledge and understanding, try and answer the quiz questions. Well done. We are now at the end of the module. Take the time to reflect on how you will take some of what you have learnt and apply it into your daily practice. It might be useful to think of some patients with wounds 
that are stuck in the cycle of inflammation and how you might manage them going forward. If you are on the NMC register, then please click the link shown to access a copy of the revalidation form. The form is in two parts with a front sheet where you simply fill in your details and a back sheet which allows for deeper reflection. Adding to this reflection will mean that you will be able to claim extra CPD minutes. So thank you for your time today. Please remember to look at other sections of the Smith & Nephew channel to access additional modules to help you on your journey.